Greetings this morning from Botswana. You have heard different times on this video, on the channel I do, I take aim at the prosperity gospel. There is a lot of taking aim at the prosperity gospel, and it is a good thing. It is something that I'm dealing with a lot here, and the Lord had told me to share much on what, just on what I'm going through, what we're seeing here. Uh, it is not only, though, about the prosperity gospel, but in this case, what I'm doing is I'm taking aim at one verse, because what happens is when these prosperity teachers come about, they will typically take a verse and they will use it to support them, which they could do by taking a verse, but they can't take it in light of the entire scripture and in, in light of the entire word of God. And that's what we must do as Christians. Years ago, I faced this when I started studying the word of God and I had a website that we used at that time. But wow, was I ever, was I ever humbled? Because just when I thought I knew something and I was bringing forth, you know, articles, which is what it was, they were blogs, essentially articles, uh, I would find something later that greatly modified my view because scripture is so rich. And so I had a lot of study to do in the word, not that I or anyone else can ever know everything. But when it comes to the prosperity teaching, rather than simply say, that was a fly, by the way, <laughs> rather than simply say, well, the prosperity gospel is unbiblical. I want to show you just an example of why it isn't biblical. You know, I'm looking at the broad testimony of scripture. A lot of times we don't get into that because, you know, we think it's obvious. It takes time. Who wants to do that? But I'm going to try to take a little time with this today and just use one verse. There are other verses that I could use and Lord willing, I will do a, a video or so on another verse. Uh, in the near future. You know, I've entitled this one, When Riches Are Not Money. The verse we are looking at comes from 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And this is what it says from the King James Bible. I wrote it down. So it doesn't, you know, my clipboard is faithfully transcribing it. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. As you can see, that would be a, a classic verse for prosperity teachers to use to say, you see, by the grace of God, you will be rich. In other words, and I, I've thought of this, maybe you'll think it's amusing, I've said it before. It's almost like instead of Jesus dying for our sins to save us from hell, you look at the death of, of the Savior as, as saving our souls, you look at it as you're going to receive a wealthy inheritance from a wealthy relative. You know, my uncle who was in oil is just about to give me a cut, you know, that came from him. And it's, of course, that's not a good way to look at it, especially uh, it would be a reflection on where your soul is at. So when you see this, you see, it says that you through his poverty might be rich. Now we're going to look back at this verse a little bit later. But what I want to do is say, what about the other scriptures? And so I want to take a little time just to look at some of them. And I focus on the New Testament because that's where we live today. We don't live in the Old Testament, but if you even did look in the Old Testament, it would be very supportive of the New Testament. But the New Testament is just much more adamant against riches, identifying them as corruptors. So we see this, this verse, 2 Corinthians 8 9, makes it look like Jesus wants you to have a pile of money in the bank or you know, in some type of safe. But I just read this. I'm being tedious. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to start, actually, it's kind of in, uh, in mid-paragraph with verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, 
patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed the good profession before many witnesses. If that isn't a warning, I don't know what is. Now, some would say, well, that's just the love of money, you know, and I don't love money that much. Well, let me take another scripture for you. I'll just go back to this. This one is in Luke 16, 13, is also from Matthew 6, 24. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Remember that. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon is money or material riches. Of course, that would be representative of what money buys. You can't serve both. But this last day's church says, oh yes, you can have both. Go to God and he'll give you that very thing that he says will hurt you and take you from him. That is just a lie. Remember that Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. When he gave the example of how to pray, I believe it is in Luke eleven three. 3, he said, he is saying, Father, give us day by day our daily bread. And when you want a pile of money, you don't want your bread day by day. You want to know that you're going to eat well for months or years to come. Let me just go on. This is one scripture. It is a powerful one, I will say, from 1 Timothy. Again, all of these will be in the description at the bottom of the page. But I just want to hear this. I'm staying mostly in Luke because it's convenient for uh, flipping back and forth. This was in Jesus' mother Mary. This is her This is her profession as she is being, you know, prophesied over for, uh, for the baby that is that will be born of her, that is in her womb. I think she is with Elizabeth at this time. Listen to what she says, Luke 153. He, that is God, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. Ooh, that doesn't sound very good to me. What did Mary know, huh? Was she in the spirit? Yes, she was. We see in Luke 6.20, Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. We look at 6.24. Woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. You know, if you're getting rewarded for things in this life, why would you expect all kinds of goodies in heaven? Why would you do that? You've already been rewarded. You're going to go to heaven and be disappointed. Just again, like my friend who said, I want to see America before I die. And I, I did. I, I rebuked him over this. As a Christian, he should never be saying something like that. He's implying that heaven will be a disappointment if he hasn't gotten to fulfill his desire on earth. And we know that's not true as Christians, and he probably knows that, but it's not something he should be saying with his, with his mouth. I will also look now from, of course, we know the scripture. I will say it again, though, from Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, that's Jesus saying this, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. He has to deny himself. This whole thing with the prosperity teaching is not about self-denial. It's about self-indulgence because that's what it's being looked to. It's like God is rewarding you with worldly goods. He has said we need treasure in heaven, not treasure on earth where thieves can break in and steal. You know, the economies can tank. Your dollar, your pula, your quacha, whatever you have, will not be worth nearly as much. You can't control that. But you need to have treasure in heaven, which will never fade away. And this is what the Bible teaches us. I will look here next at, at Mark. I'm using this example of the rich young ruler. This is one in which that I may go over more in a specific video later on. But just listen. I mean, the rich young ruler, you know. Well, listen to this. This is the instruction that Jesus gave to the rich young ruler because he knew that he needed something yet. Even though he was a good person, he obeyed the commandments. Jesus said, the scripture says, he beheld him and loved him. And he said to him, one thing you lack, 
Go thy way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Do you see what Jesus says? He's saying, give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Take up the cross, follow me. So you see the nature of a Christian life. This is exactly what his disciples had done already. He is not turning around and rewarding us with material goods that we have just given up to follow him. He will provide our need. That's the key for the, for the Christian supply in the Lord. But this is what he says later. And he's talking to his disciples after their rich young ruler leaves. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And his disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and saith to them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That's pretty strong. And my question is, and you know, there are numerous other passages that I could use here. What do you do with these passages if you are trying to exalt 2 Corinthians 8, 9, saying God will make you rich? He's telling you of all the pitfalls of being rich and that you shouldn't seek this. You should be trusting him day by day. Like here it says, you know, Jesus is saying how hard it is for those who trust in riches. And some might say, well, I don't really trust in riches. How do you learn not to trust in riches if you always have them? You always trust in your riches. It's silly. You have to go without to trust in the Lord, such as the life of George Mueller. You have to go without. Sometimes he had more. Sometimes he had less. He always had enough. And he didn't live for himself. He was a steward of God's supply. I also wanted to read this to you. This is kind of telling. This comes from Revelation chapter 3. This is the last church. And I believe this applies to us well today. Just listen to this. I'll read this in verses 16 and 17 from chapter 3. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That means vomit. Makes him sick. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? He explains, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. God has made me rich. But the truth is you don't need him anymore. You're not walking in faith. You're trusting in what you see before you. You want to do away with faith because faith is the evidence of things you don't see. You want to trust in the Lord and it makes him sick that you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. The Christians that say, oh, he will make you rich. What? Just like Bill Gates, Donald Trump, all of these wicked earthly men who are just doing evil, uh, Hugh Hefner of Playboy, all of these athletes, actors, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Who is it? Who are you looking to? But they're not living for Christ and they're getting their riches. Why are you trying to be like them? You shouldn't be like them. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little impassioned, but I'm saying that the, the prosperity gospel will take a verse here or there and twist it. They won't really put any thought into it and say, look, you're going to be rich. You're going to have a pile of gold. But they ignore all of these other scriptures that give a testimony against it. And so I just encourage you then to take the full counsel of God's word, what the Lord has to say. As we go back, I want to look at this verse again from 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and let's see something and just consider the words that are in this verse. As you know, I have this written down on my clipboard. Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now I ask you, what is this saying? Jesus was rich. How was Jesus rich? He said, for your sakes, he became poor. Hmm? The reason that Jesus was rich is because he is the creator of the universe. He was with God the Father. He was with the Holy Spirit in his glory in heaven. That was his riches. It was the riches of eternal glory. His praise, his honor that he was enjoying before the world began. And this is what he did. 
You know, he left his throne in heaven and he came and he humbled himself. So he became poor compared to the riches of his glory, which had nothing to do with silver or gold. Do you really think that Jesus is taken by the gold that he created? He created everything. Silver and gold isn't worth anything to him. He will supply us with what we need. But if we're looking at the riches of Christ, and then we're saying here, he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. In other words, because he left heaven, his glory in heaven, to come and take our sins on the cross, now we can be rich to share in that glory in heaven. That's the riches of Jesus Christ. It's not material wealth. He has promised us he will supply our needs according to his riches and glory. He has said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He will add all the things we need to us. So, but even in this verse, you see, how was Jesus rich? How did he become poor? That is how we, through his poverty, will become rich in the same way that he was rich. We will be rich with the glories of heaven. Anytime he gives us money now, it is for our needs or for the needs of others, primarily in the body of Christ, but it may be for someone who's really struggling. Please don't think it's for you to indulge in all kinds of lavish gifts or vacations. He is not trying to allure you through worldly love, because if you love your life in this world, you will lose it. Look at John 12, 25. Anyway, now I'm going to read this also. We are very familiar with this. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And that just means what? I can be rich? Hmm? I guess that's what prosperity teachers would like you to think. But maybe we should look back a couple verses and see what God is really saying here. We'll start in verse, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It doesn't exactly sound the same, does it? Paul is saying he has learned to be content in whatever circumstances he has. God has promised to supply our need. Here it is a few verses later in verse 19 of Philippians 4. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Sometimes we may need a little bit. I can remember one time I was walking to the store. I wanted to get a loaf of bread. I thought I had enough money for my loaf of bread. Along the way, I found 10 cents. Well, what's 10 cents? It's a dime. It's the smallest coin in the U.S. I got to the store and I found that I had miscalculated and I needed six more cents to get that loaf of bread. Do you think God was supplying my need? And yes, I could have afforded not to eat a little bread for a little while longer. But do you understand? The riches of God are not material. We cannot serve God and mammon. There are other riches, riches of, of peace, riches of joy when we're having tribulation, riches to know we don't fear death. Because God has prepared a place for us. To know that he loved us so much. He commends his love to us so that we were, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So yes, I'll be looking more at this. You can pick a verse here or there that might support prosperity teaching by itself. But you won't find that in the context of the Bible. And so I urge you to prayerfully look at the full counsel of God's word and joyfully receive what he has prepared for you. I hope this will be a blessing to you today, and God bless.